service tonight. We're glad that you're tuning in across Facebook, wherever you might be across the country. We have people watching from all over the states and, and overseas, and we appreciate it. And uh, so continue to watch and take part with us. Uh, tonight, we're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 12. We're glad to have Ethan with us tonight, uh, visiting with us. And, uh, he come here to pray, and so we're going to be talking about prayer tonight, so he picked a good night to come. So, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12, we're going to read one verse, and we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about what this chapter includes uh, a little bit later on, but we're going to talk about prayer tonight, and we're going to talk about just what Samuel says to the children of Israel here in 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23. Let's read that. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Well, I just thought that was a very interesting statement. That I should, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. You know, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. The sin of not praying for others. The ministry of praying for others is in great, constant demand. Not only people that we know, but people we don't know. But uh, listen, do you think we need to be praying for Israel tonight? Yes. We better be. Uh, and, and listen, we don't know these people. We don't know the circumstances. We don't know everything that happens. But listen, we need to be praying for others. Now, there are a lot of things that keep us from praying. It's a great demand, and we should be doing it. But listen, how many times are we so lackadaisical in our, our approach to God and for others and even for ourselves? There, there are several reasons for it. I'll give you a few, and I'm sure you can name a few others. Selfishness. I'm more concerned about my needs and, and my, what's going on in my life than I'm concerned about what's going on in your life. And so I become selfish in my prayer. I become impatient. I don't have time. I don't have time to sit down and pray for people that need prayer. I, I, I'm too busy. We're all busy. I have a desire for other things going on in my life and prayer, you know, it's just not on the top of that list. A lack of love for others. Listen, there's just, uh, I, I see it everywhere. Uh, we're, we're, more, uh, we're more concerned about how people look, uh, what they might say, what they might do, than, than about what's going on in here in, in a person's heart. Lack of faith in God. Do we really believe, do we really, really believe that God answers prayer? Do we really believe we're praying to someone who is alive and well and on the throne and listening to the prayers of the saints? Do we really believe in that? These are some of the things that are among the, that account for why there's such a lack of prayer on behalf of other individuals. In this chapter 12, Samuel is kind of well up in years. Samuel's a great story in itself because of Hannah who prayed for a man-child, not just a child, but a man-child. And God granted that wish because she was barren. She didn't have children. So God granted that wish, and she said, if you will give me a man-child, I will give him back to you all the days of his life. So after he was weaned, he took him to the house of God, he took him to Eli, and he said, here's the child that I prayed for. He used to live here, serve God all of his life. Well, the Lord began to speak to uh, Samuel at an early age. And as time went along, hey, oh, geez, Rachel. How are you? Uh, we miss you around here. Hey, Larry. Not that we don't miss you too, Larry. All right. <laughs> We're in 1 Samuel chapter 12. And so Samuel became prophet of God. Eli was letting his boys do things in the house of God that shouldn't be done. And they all died on the same day. But anyway, Samuel kind of took over. Well, Samuel's gone through this whole life of living and serving God, became one of the greatest prophets that we see in the Word of God. And in this chapter 12, he's getting up in age and he tells them, I need to go over some things with you. You know, and they had just, they had just anointed Saul as king. You remember they said, we want a king over us like all the other nations. 
And he said, that was wrong for you to ask that because God's your king. And you weren't recognizing God as your king. You wanted a, 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 a person uh, sitting there on a throne. And so the Lord's giving you sin and giving you Saul. And so he tells him in this chapter, he said, I want you to sit still and I want you just to listen to me for a minute. And he says, I want you to, I want to go back and recount some things for you. How that you prayed to God and he delivered you out of Egypt. And how you fell into the hands of the Philistines and you fell into the hands of the Amorites and you fell into the hands of, of, of Ammon and all these other, and you prayed and God delivered you out of those. I want to remind you of that. Because what I want you to understand is that when I'm long gone, you and your king, your Saul, as long as you are willing to serve the Lord and do that which is right, he will bless you. But if you choose not to, and you choose to do wrong, and you choose to do evil, he will not bless you. Isn't it really just that simple? Right. We want to complicate this thing about living for Jesus and serving God and doing right and wrong, but it's just that simple. You cannot expect to live like you want to and serve the world and not serve the Lord, not be interested in what he says, not want to do what he says, and expect to be blessed. It, it, just, it just doesn't work right. Listen, can you become part of the blessing? Listen, it rains on the just and the unjust. So if you've got a farmer here that's a Christian and you've got a farmer here that's a non-Christian, it's going to rain on both their crops. So they're going to receive blessings because of being around Christians. Do you know what holds the evil back? And, and listen, as prevalent as it is, and we can see it all around us, do you know what holds it back today? The church. Right. And that's where the Holy Spirit is, living within us. The Spirit of God is holding that back. When the rapture goes, you do not want to be here and face what's going to happen in those days. So, he says, do right, serve the Lord. And he says, and I, I tell you what I'm going to do. He said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in not praying for you. I think it is a sin, folks. I think it's a sin that many of us, if not all of us, and myself included at times, that we just simply fail. God in praying for others. Others around us, others we come in contact with, others that we meet here or meet there, others that ask us to pray and we say we will and then we don't. We, there, all of these things going around in our world today, in our church today, in our families today, and we'll mention a few here uh, as we get going, but, but listen, I think it's a sin for us just to think that nothing's ever going to change, nothing's ever going to be different, I don't have time, I'm, all, I'm too worried about my own self and my own needs. I think it is a sin before the Lord. And then he ends it up by saying, I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he has done for you. Man, I, I just love the word of God. It is so, if you really look at it, it is so plain and simple. We do not need to muddy the waters and complicate it at all. But we do. So, Abraham pleaded for Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18. Did he not pray for them? Did he not ask God? He even got to the point where he thought God was going to be mad at him because he kept lowering the number. If I find 50 people that are righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, would you save the cities? The Lord said yes. Is that about 40? Okay. 30? Uh, uh, all right. 20? Okay. Well, Lord, please don't be mad at me. What about 10? And I, I, I picture, and I may have put this more, I picture Abraham standing there with his hands behind his back, and he's counting his family. Lot, his wife, the daughters at home, the daughters that started to be married, their husband. I think he was counting up on his fingers, and he said, Lord, please don't be mad at me, but would you save it for 10? He said, I'll save you for 10. They could not find right. 10 righteous in the city. But we find Abraham. It wasn't going to be his fault. 
that fire and brimstone was going to fall on that city? Because he prayed. He pleaded that it wouldn't happen if they could find any righteous in there. How about Jacob who wrestled with the angel all night? And the angel says, it's coming daylight. You need to let me go. And he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. When's the last time you wrestled all night in prayer? When's the last time you couldn't sleep because things were burdening on your heart and were burning on your mind and in your soul? Moses fasted and prayed 40 days and 40 nights. Yee. I had to have a hot dog just to eat church tonight. He fasted and prayed 40 days and 40 nights. Why? Because of the wickedness of Israel. And you find that in Deuteronomy 9. For the wickedness of his people. For their faltering away from God. For their not trusting in the Lord. And he fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights over this wickedness of his people. What's that? We can't even skip a meal. We can't even skip a meal. First thing out of my mouth, first thing in the morning, what's for breakfast? <laughs> when Peter was in prison, the church was praying for him. They prayed for his deliverance. We talked about this last Sunday. And miraculously, the Lord delivered him out of prison. Acts chapter 12. Romans 1.9. Now, we're going to talk a lot about prayer about others. And, and I want you to see it because the scripture is full of it. I think we just overlooked it. Romans 1.9 says, For God is my witness, Paul says, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. That's what Paul says to the Romans, to the Roman Jews, and to the Gentiles. He says, look, I have you, I mention you always in my prayers. Can you imagine the prayer of Paul and all the saints that he called up before the Lord? Just when he went to the Lord in prayer. Listen, if you call on Paul to pray in church service, you best have a lunch. Because he's he going to pray. And he's going to touch all bases. Let me read a couple more for you here. One is in Ephesians. And you can turn with me if you want to follow along. Or you can get these from me later. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord, Jesus, and the love of, unto all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, and the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory and his inheritance in the saints. Boy, you almost can't stop reading. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all the churches, which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So here he is with the Ephesians. You are in my prayers, and I'm praying that you would get the knowledge and the wisdom of the Lord of what to do and how to live in your life. And then in this chapter, uh, chapter 3 of the same book, verse 13. Wherefore I desire you, faint not at my tribulations, for you which is his glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all fullness of God. Listen, Paul didn't just pray, uh, Lord bless Connie, Lord bless Lorraine, Lord bless Rachel. No, no, no. He prayed more specifically than that. They need strength. 
They need courage. They need wisdom. They need knowledge. They need to get through it. They need faith to be strong that they won't falter in this world when the enemy rises against them. They need all of these things, God. And he bows on his knees and he cries out to God on their behalf. You can see why Samuel says, God forbid that I should sin against not praying for others. Philippians 1, I thank God for every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day even until now. So now he's saying it to the Philippians. He's already said it to the Ephesians. He's already said it to the Romans. Now he's going to say it to the Colossians. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. And then in chapter 4 and verse 10 to the Colossians, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you may stand perfect and complete in all in the will of God. Listen, it wasn't just one or two things that he was praying for. He was praying for everything, for everybody, because he realized the seriousness of praying to strengthen the brethren. I'm going to give you one more that's in the book of Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. Listen. Paul was serious about his prayer life for the individual and for the groups and for the churches and for the people. Why was the early church so strong? Because they cared enough to pray for one another. Not just once a week, but every day. Without ceasing. How can we do that? How can we pray without ceasing? In an attitude of prayer. Always on my mind. You don't have to bow your head and get on your knees to talk with the Lord. Please don't do that while you're driving down the road. Just drive. <laughs> just drive. But you can still pray. You can still commune with God. You can still bring, bring things to the Lord. So pray without ceasing. Always remembering each other. That's why the early church was so, was so full of power. Full of strength. Full of courage. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. We're getting back. We, we look at that and we say, man, they were under such persecution as a church. We're about to find that out here in these United States of America. I think it's coming. And we need to be prepared. And we best start learning how to pray and pray for one another. I'm not just praying for me and for my safety. That's pretty selfish, isn't it? Let me give you three things that we need to be praying for in others. Number one is we need to pray for others that they might be strengthened. In Luke 22, we have the story of, of, of Jesus uh, at the Last Supper. And he's trying to explain some things to his disciples. And he knows, looking at them, that one of them is going to go and betray him for 30 pieces of silver. And one is going to deny him three times at, that night in, in front of a crowd. And they're all going to flee and, uh, when, once he's captured in the garden of Gethsemane. And so he realizes that these things are going to happen because he's Christ. So he says to Peter, he says to Peter in Luke 22, he says, I have prayed for you. And he looked right at Peter and said, I have prayed for you for that, thou, that your faith fail not. And he had just told him, look, the devil's wanting to sift you as wheat. He's wanting to just shake you up. And listen, you're, you're going to feel it because the minute I'm captured, and the minute I'm taken, 
you're going to be shaken. And the devil's going to sift you like wheat. And he's going to hope that nothing re remains in here except you. And he can just sift you around. He says, I pray for you that your faith fail not. And listen to what he says. And when you're converted, strengthen the brother. What do you think that means? When you're converted, strengthen the brother. You think Peter was lost? Have you ever turned away, even if it's for a moment or a day or a, a situation or something, have you just turned away? We, we do things, we say things, we wonder things, God, where are you, Lord, let me down, or we say all kinds of things. We do all kinds of things. Peter, of course, you know, oh, I'm ready to go to prison and die with you, yeah. Yeah, that's all we talk, Peter, and I know all about all that. And I, I see your heart, and I know, I know it's, you know, you're, you got it, and here you're, you're, you know. But you're about to get sifted like you ain't never been sifted before by the enemy. And you're going to be shaken. But I'm praying that your faith fail not. That you get through the shaking up, and your faith doesn't fail. And when you got to the other side, and you've got the victory over these things, then you go and strengthen your brethren over these things. And he did. And he did. He absolutely did. What a different person he became in the book of Acts. Listen, when you have overcome the sifting of the devil, when you overcome the sifting of your fears, do you think at the moment they challenged him outside of the camp, looking in at Jesus getting slapped around, do you think he was fearful at that moment? But just a few hours ago, he acted like he had no fear. But look where he was at. Listen, we talk about it all the time. It's easy to shout the hallelujahs in the church house. Well, how do you live when you're outside the church house? That's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? When you're confronted with things in your life. What do you do then? So when you when you sifted and overcome your fears, when you sifted and overcome your trials, listen, he had no clue what Jesus was talking about was going to happen to him that very night. There's no way in his mind after walking with Jesus for three and a half years that he could comprehend what was about to happen to him. His trials, he had no idea it was going to be this hard. He had no idea it was going to be this fearful. He had no idea he was going to have this kind of doubt in his mind. Strength. 
and I need to be praying for that. And God strengthened her. Randy just found out the Jim's neighbor who had his open heart surgery. Now he's got COVID. Ah, just pile that on, right? He needs strength. We need to be praying that his family gets strengthened through this. I think about Bree. She's awaiting test results now, but everything's starting to turn on an upturn for her once again. And, and it's possible to get her back on this donor's list. And so, so they're just waiting Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. They get the results of these all these biopsies. You don't think this family needs strength through these times to get a, another bad news or another answer that puts it off or another? She's been doing this all her life. Strength. Strength. Pray for others that might be strengthened in sorrow, not just in suffering. But how about sorrow? Look, Chip just lost his brother. Now, he's a Christian, but he's still his brother. He's still his family. He's still suffering from the separation of that. When we were when we were at Chip's just a, a, about a couple months ago, um, I got a chance to go with Chip over to see his brother. He's always, he's been for a while, he's pretty bad physical health. But he was feeling good enough, and we went in and we spent about an hour or so uh, there chatting with him about the Lord and about life and about things. And I was just so glad I got that opportunity, you know, because I didn't get to see him again after that. And, uh, but I'll see him again in heaven. So that's encouraging. But listen, until I get to heaven, I still got sorrow. In my heart and in my life, who's praying for me? Who's asking God to strengthen me? Do you see why it's a sin not to? Just see, no, my brothers and sisters are suffering and I don't do anything. Rachel, I got you on my list tonight. I don't know Rachel's going to be here tonight. What's the latest on your father? Let's just do that first.
Okay, that's a good definition. Anybody got anything else to add to that? It's something against the truths of God. Going against the truths of the Word of God. And listen, he told Timothy, these things are going to happen, brother. They're going to come, and you need to be prepared for it. And he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, let me read a couple verses to you. He says in verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That time's now. We're living in it. They will not endure sound doctrine. They won't listen to the gospel message. They don't want to hear the, the, stra the straight teaching of the word of God. And they don't want to stand on the word of God. We need to pray that we would hold fast to sound doctrine, not to heresies, not to things that goes against it. Everyone's trying to disprove the Bible. We need to hold fast to the word and pray that each other will do that, that we will hold on to the word of God, we'll stand on the word of God, and we will not give in to these that are trying to push us away from. Pray for each other that we might be delivered from evil, evil habits. Mm, that's a good one, isn't it? I'm going to give you a couple that we might not throw in there. Uh, I, I, I can think of a couple you might think of right off your mind. But listen, when I talk about habits, let's talk about some, some different kind of habits. How about this one? Lying. Listen, do you think Christians are above getting into a habit of lying? No, they're not. Truthful and honest. Listen, we need to pray that we'll be that. Because not only do we need to be truthful with ourselves, it will help us be truthful with God, and it will help us be truthful with others. Listen, you say, well, I don't lie. Really? Has somebody ever said, hey, I thought I'd come over Tuesday? And you say, oh, oh, oh well, I'm going to be busy too. And what you really meant was, uh, I'm sleeping in Tuesday and I don't want to get up early enough to have to have people come over. Yeah. Is that a lie? When you tell somebody that uh, you can't make it because uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, the sniffles are coming on, I'm not, able to make it. I'm, not, I'm not feeling really good. But yet, it didn't stop you from doing anything else in your day. But it was going to stop you dead cold. do that one thing. Did we lie about it? You know, Morbus Semiticus is a disease that's more rampant than you really understand that it is. See, Morbus Semiticus is that I'm too tired and I'm too sick to go to church on Sunday morning, but I don't care how I feel on Monday, I'm going to work. I've got to work, but I don't have to go to church. I, listen, in my book, it's the other way around. Right. If I'm too sick to go to work, the Lord will take care of that. But if I don't go to church, I better be so powerful sick about coming and being. Now, I'm not talking about spreading some flu or COVID or anything else with some other people. I'm just saying, I think we do lie. And I think we need to be praying for one another that we will be delivered from a habit of telling lies. Have you ever told the, the, the checks in the mail? When it's sitting on your desk, or it's not going in the mail for another week, <laughs> whatever it is. How about the habit of hypocrisy? Do you know what a hypocrite is? Can anybody give me a definition of that? An actor. That's a perfect definition. Playing the role of someone you're not. Do we do that as Christians? Do we put on a good show for people? <laughs> so we need to be praying that God would help deliver us from this habit of hypocrisy. We need to be the people that what you see is what you get. Not that I, 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 I'm this person when I'm with this person, and I'm this person when I'm with this person, and I'm this person when I'm with this person. Now I'm not talking about Paul saying I've become all things to all men, and I might by all means save some. He just meant I can relate to this person, and I can relate to this person, and I can relate to this person. But Paul was always Paul. Pray for others 
that they might be delivered from hate. Do you know how many people today hate somebody? And they and they got that in their heart. You can see it. You talk to them about somebody, you bring up a certain man here, you can just see it coming up and up. They, they say they've forgiven them, they say they won't, they haven't. It's still there. So when I, when, when I have hatred rising up in me and laying wait in to, to, to bushwhack me at times, it's going to interfere with my love for someone else, my love for others, when I'm harboring that in my own heart. We need to be praying that we might be delivered from that. Listen, I, don't, I may not like everything everybody does. Everybody may, certainly you don't like everything I do. But you know what? That I cannot afford to have hate rise up in me and in my heart that keeps me from praying for them in a right way. Not praying that God would annihilate them off the face of the earth. Number three. Pray for others that they might be saved. I don't know what the Lord has in mind for revival at Gosberg Community Church in Manchester, Tennessee. Lord's placed some things on my heart. Uh, I'll, I'll be wore out before I ever get there because I, I, I have to preach these things in my mind, you know, ahead of time. And so trying to get these ready. And listen, it's not just a Sunday morning. It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Those four services in a row. And you pray for me because I haven't preached a revival in 30 years. And it's, for me, it's a group that I don't know. I don't know these people. But I have to say, Lord, what do they need? Use me to speak to their needs. So I've got to be faithful. What he puts on my heart, I've got to present it, whatever it is. And I've got to trust God. Now listen, here's what I know that church needs. It's the same thing our church needs. We need to see people saved. We need to see people come to Jesus. We need to be praying that God would save people and asking God to save people that we might know about it, we could share in it, we could rejoice in it. Yeah, I tell you what, the churches today just aren't going around talking about how many people got saved Sunday. But I can remember a time when we did. I can remember a time when we would think it's strange that somebody did get saved on a Sunday. Somebody didn't walk the aisle and get it right with God. Whether backslid or saved or, or, or not serving the Lord the way they should. Man, it just, listen, when the sermon was over, it was another 45 minutes get through the invitation. The singing and the weeping and the testifying. And the, what, what, how would you feel if in a church like that? How would you feel the altar was full on Sunday and people were weeping and People were standing up and testifying about what God had done in their heart this morning. And, and, and somebody stand up and say, I just give my life to Jesus. And, and somebody stand up and say, you know, I've been away from the Lord for a long time and I just came back to the Lord today. And, and somebody else stood up and said, I haven't been serving God like I should, but boy, the Lord got a hold of me this morning and, and teared up. How would you feel about being in a service like that? Would that energize you? Would that make you get excited? Would that make you feel with the tears streaming down your cheeks as you looked at them and seen the sincerity of their hearts? Listen, we need to see it, folks. We need real revival. We don't just need a week of services. We need God to do something. I mean it. <laughs> when Stephen's life was leaving him, he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Very similar to what Jesus said on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Pray for others that they might be awakened from their unconcern. Backsliders. Israel's backslid. Isaiah chapter 1, God called them backsliders. And they were. But he said, in Acts 1, I mean in, uh, uh, what did I say, Isaiah? I 
Isaiah 1, verse 18. Here's what he says. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Backslidden Israel. But there's that softness of God, that mercy of God, and that grace of the Lord to say, come now, let's reason together about this sin. Let's get it washed under the blood. Let's get it taken care of. The world's distracted us from our service. In Romans 13. And I wanted to read all these scriptures to you tonight because they're all so important. The scripture is full of this subject. In Romans 13 and verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The world has distracted us long enough. Set those things aside. Set them aside. Pray for one another that we would set those things aside. Hebrews 13, 9 says... Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. We need to pray for each other that we would stay on the right path. Pray for others that they might see the awfulness of rejecting Christ. The worst thing that a person could do is reject his invitation. Think of someone right now that you know is lost. <coughs> and if they died today, have you done everything you could to try to reach them for Christ? Especially praying for their soul. You know, I may not be the kind of person who goes knock the door. I may not be the kind of person who step up in front of somebody and talk to them about Jesus. But I'll tell you what, all of us can be people of I can get on my knees and I can ask the Lord in prayer to do something. Send someone that they might come to know Christ. Samuel said, moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. I will never get the victory over this sin unless I God changed my heart toward myself. It's not about me. Changed my heart toward the Lord. Changed my heart toward others. I'll never get past the sin of not praying for others until I change. Until the Lord changes. Do we understand what's at stake? Someone said to me today, why do you preach the way you do? Why do you teach the way you do? Why do you say the things that you say? Why are you so straight? Why are you so adamant about it? Why are, why are you so hard about some of these things? When I go other places, and they're too easy about these things. They don't talk about these things. I've been to a church that didn't even open their Bible. 
the preacher had 15 minutes and got up and just spoke about whatever. It, it would, didn't amount to anything. What, why is it that you get up here and you preach like that? It's simple, folks, for me. Time's running out. For me, as a person, I'm going to die one of these days. Time's going to be over for me. And I won't get that opportunity to share with someone else or to reach out to someone else and try to help them in their walk or whatever they need. I'm not going to be able to be used by God like that. So I don't have time for that idle chit-chat. We have enough fun from the pulpit as it is. You guys still laugh at all my dumb jokes and all the stupid things I do, and I appreciate it. So we have some fun, but listen, folks, we have fun while at the same time while I'm trying to point us seriously to the cross. You know, this, go ahead. Ed. Everybody taking the ear today, <laughs> and uh, I, I thank God for you because you don't take it. I'm interested in, in my uh, name being built up or. My reputation, or uh, you know, the way people feel about me, but I, I'm not worried about any of that stuff. I think what I am worried about is that one day I will stand before God and I will give an account of everything He had me do from this pulpit and any other pulpit I've been in, and any other day of my life. And I, those things concern me. Those things are are serious in my life, and I just I just can't. I just I, I wish I wish I picked up on it. 30 years ago. Right. But I think the older I get, the more I pick up on it. Maybe it's closer. The closer I get, the more that becomes really real reality for me. So I, I, I don't know, but I know that we, this subject tonight about praying for one another. I can't tell you what it does for me when somebody comes up and says, I've been praying for you. Or I get a text that says, Hey, I'm praying for you. Just wanted you to know I was praying for you today. You know, or somebody stops me at church and says, Hey, I just want I, I was praying for you today. I it was on my mind today. Listen, you don't you don't know what that means to somebody. So how can I sin against the Lord and not praying for others? Not praying for every one of you. Do you know, in my mind, when I'm at home in the middle of the night, you know, where I do most of my prayer, uh, I can see your face and every one of you where you sit on that pew. <laughs> <laughs> you know how I know how many's in You know how I know how many's in attendance on Sunday? I go to my mind, I go to this side, and I just start counting. I know right where everybody was. I go to this side, uh, but the strange thing is, when I'm preaching, I have no idea where you're sitting. Yeah. Unless unless something happens that <clears throat> one of you catch my eye and, and I stop and say, Crump right on him? You know, I might do that, you know, but uh, but I, I don't see it. I thank God for that. I, I don't want to, you know, see that. But. Joe, maybe, maybe the world is so evil today because we have neglected to be praying. We have bought into a lifestyle kind of evangelism rather than you know, what we're used to. How many have seen the movie War Room? Oh, yeah. You don't have to. You know what that lady did? She had a closet. And she had, this is where she went to battle, folks. She went into that closet with all these names written on the wall, and she went in there and started praying for these people and what they needed and what these individuals were going through and strengthened faith and courage and all those things that we should be praying for one another about. I don't know what you're facing the rest of this week, but I should be praying about it. And, and maybe it's just the same old thing, or maybe you're just in such a routine, you don't really have a whole lot going on, but you know what? There's still, the devil will try and find some way to get to you. So should I be praying that that doesn't happen? That your faith is strengthened? Well, I just, I just kind of felt like this was a, a good time to, to bring this up because it's not, this is, this is not the, now I live in out of sleep prayer. Uh, this right. is something much more than that. This is 
getting on our knees uh, along with God on behalf of one another. Things happen when churches pray. I've seen a lot of revivals without much preaching, but I ain't never seen a revival without much prayer. And and I, I hope and I, I trust. I know Chip's been praying and, and Connie's been praying, and I hope their church. And I'm sure they are all praying, but they may not even know what they're praying for, right? They, they have no idea what they're in for for a week. But uh, yeah, listen, I don't know either. Right. I don't know either. What I want to see is people saved. That's what Chip wants to see. That's what your church wants to see. So I hope that what the Lord gives me and what happens in this week, we see people saved. We see people return. We see people get on fire for God. Listen, let revival start and move on. What was that school that had all that going on for a long time? Asbury. Asbury College. Right? Let's have another Asbury College. That started in Mansfield, Tennessee. Or Manchester. Might be in Mansfield, Tennessee. I don't know. You pray for me. Um, I was telling others earlier that, uh, and you that are watching my Facebook, you're still in on all this. But um, my nephew and his wife, who got saved at my brother's funeral, uh, live about 40 minutes from where I'm going to be preaching, and uh, they're going to be there on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very excited about that and uh, getting a chance to visit with them. Saturday and, uh, and then have them in church on Sunday. So you be much in prayer that the devil won't uh, disrupt that from happening and uh, we'll get a chance to see them. And, and uh, so looking forward, looking forward to that. So you, you pray for those services. Pray for Tim. Tim Gallagher is going to fill this pulpit next a week from Sunday. You pray that God puts a fire in his soul and, and a message on his heart that, that we need to hear. And you pray for Dave Davidson. You pray for Chris's dad, Dave. He's going to preach. He's going to, he's going to bring the, the Bible study uh, not next Wednesday, a week from next Wednesday, two weeks from tonight. He's going to bring the Bible study. You pray. Listen, I talked to this man. This man is a student of the Word. You pray that God puts on him what you and I need to hear because all of us are doing it. We need to be praying, folks. We need to be all joking again. Oh, well, we know. No, we need to be praying. Praying for all of it. Listen, we need you to pray that we travel safe. That's a long way to go uh, in this crazy world in which we live in. We have major towns to go through like Indianapolis and, and Louisville and Nashville just to get there. And it's crazy. These people are nuts. So. <laughs> and uh, so you pray for our safety as we travel and uh, to get there and back. Um, but man, Worship still goes on here. Amen? Amen. And that's, that's you. That's you and the Lord. That's Tim. That's the lead, his leadership. And listen, I got no doubts about David and Tim filling this spot. And listen, I'll tell you now, I'm picky about who's going to stand up here. It ain't going to be just anybody. All right. I think I've laid out my whole heart. Listening, I hope that if for nothing else, and you watching my Facebook, I hope that we realize just how important we are to each other. Because we all make up the same body of Christ. So I can't, I, I, because I'm the eye, I can't say I don't need to hear. Where am I going to hear from just one eye? I could be bad eye like a cat. <laughs> but what, you know, I, I need the ear. And I need the hands, and I need the feet, and we all make up one body. And when, listen, what you, I told this to Rachel the other day, when you stub your toe, don't you immediately get a headache? Listen, when one part of your body hurts, other things hurt. Well, that's the way it should be. When the, when the body's hurting, it should all be hurt. Man, I, I, I wouldn't in a, in a million years, Rachel, have believed that your father still be in a hospital on a respirator from what we talked about when he first went in they were going to fly him to Chicago. Yep. But the transact, listen, so we pray and we pray that the Lord will give strength and courage and wisdom and knowledge and that his will would be done and we'd be strong through it but 
We had no idea. We, we was kind of like Peter that night when Jesus said, you're going to betray me tonight. And, and you're, when the devil wants to sift you as wheat, and when you're converted, then I want you to strengthen the brethren. He, Peter had no clue what was about to happen that night, just like you had no clue it was going to come to this point. But yet, the Lord is still God, still on the throne, still working, still moving, still bringing things to pass. But listen, he says, well, didn't you ask for these things to, that you had a good team of doctors and you had a good place to so, concern about all these things? And, and what, what happens when just, you know, God just wants us to trust him. But in the midst of all that, I need to be praying. I need to pray for you. You need to pray for me. You need to pray for one another. Pray for everyone that attends this church. Everyone's connected to the church. Pray for people that you work with. Pray for people that you, you've met on the street today. You meet people all the time. Listen, Carol had a great conversation with the Social Security office. <laughs> that don't usually happen, does it? She got a good Christian woman, and they were just shouting the hallelujahs on the phone, talking to each other as they were getting Carol all set up for her old age. <laughs> I got ways to go. <coughs> Hers is January, mine's March, so I got ways to go. No, but just, you, you don't know who you're going to come in contact with for a day, but pray for them. Pray for those that you come in contact with that the Lord would strengthen them in all these different ways. That they'd be saved, they find courage and sorrow. Lord, too many times we bow before you in repetitive motion. We pray sometimes, Lord, like it doesn't matter. We pray like it's not important. We think sometimes that our little prayer to this almighty God is so small, what difference does it really make? Lord, forgive us for that day. Forgive us, Lord, for the sin of not praying for others. Let us pray for one another for the strength, the courage to live and to be what you would have us to be to the end. I don't know where the world's headed. I know it's headed to the end, but I, I don't know what all's going to happen tomorrow and next week and next year. And Lord, if you tarry long enough, 10 years from now, I have no idea what it's going to look like. But Lord, I want to strengthen the brethren. I want you to strengthen them, and I want to do it through prayer. And I want you to touch them and help them that we're stronger in 10 years from now than we certainly are today. We need to see people saved. Lord, would you bring someone, would you help us to bring someone with us on Sunday to set up the sound of the gospel that's lost? Would you help us to pray for the lost that they would find Jesus, if not through here, through someone else? Give us true revival. Touch us, Lord, in ways that we realize we've been touched by God. And lead us and strengthening each other greater than we've ever known. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for watching on Facebook. Thanks for tuning in. Hope it's been a blessing to you. I hope you realize how important your prayers are to us here and for us to pray for you.